on this farm, we have about 300,000 chickens. We're on a nine week cycle. So we will go to barn B, the top of B, and that's the birds that were vaccinated. And it's something that we have just started uh, using the last two years. Summer flocks only because the birds tend to flush a little more and the floors tend to get wet where in the summer they stay dry. And it's part of our desire to sort of get away from a chemical as far as controlling coccidiosis and doing it with a vaccine. With the, with the parasitic vaccines, we really need to manage the process when the bird is on the farm. In order uh, for the, the, uh, the eggs, the oocysts to sporulate and be infected and be able to produce that recycling, we need three things in the barn. We need uh, oxygen, we need moisture, and we need heat, warmth. The moisture component is probably the most critical to get. I figured out if you go higher than relative humidity, higher than 70, you have problems. You should stay within the old school 65, plus minus 5. And then you have the right humidity in the shavings. Sometimes when in winter time it's, it's enough, just one fan running a little bit, first five days, it's a lot. First baby chicks don't produce lots of humidity, no. right? That's why I'm saying most farmers ventilating too much. Yeah. Then yeah. it's too yeah. dry. The partial house brooding is always key as also. Uh, you won't get the moisture if you brood as you usually do with whole room brooding. So you have to put a barrier up and uh, let that moisture build a little. And if the birds are all over the place and don't encounter each other's droppings very often, they still won't be exposed to those oocysts, even if the oocysts are being perfectly taken care of temperature and humidity wise. Um, on the other hand, if humidity isn't managed correctly, they could be encountering each other's droppings, but the oocysts won't sporulate and be infective and the cycling won't occur. Um, when we use the coxivac, we brood them in half the barn. So the litter down there looks darker because they were there for the first eight days. And just anything that will ensure that the birds have the ability to react to the vaccine. So just in general, healthy birds, well nourished and well looked after, those birds will respond much better to the vaccine. You flood for the first 10 days just to get them eating, get that seven day body weight that you want, and then you start raising them up. They know where the feed is and it's okay if they work a little harder for the feed, but, but, but uh, sure, for sure it does help the vaccine. I think if you use a live vaccine, you need to be engaged. And so that means the, the monitoring the barn conditions. If you do not manage that process and get adequate recycling for at least two cycles, going up to 14, 15, or 16 days, then your vaccine definitely will not be as effective. I think that if you're that producer that's thinking about starting to use a coccidial vaccine, it might be a good idea to find a good service person and also your veterinarian to help you through those first few flocks. They can look at your management before and during the flock and also to be patient. It takes a few flocks to see the best results and also to change the, the imeria that are growing in the barn naturally. So getting some help for the first few flocks is a good idea. And what a lot of producers would do when they vaccinate their birds, they would give um, vaccine for three crops in a row and then come back to a coccidiostat program for the rest of the year. And under that circumstance, we seem to get a very good response. We found when we take the birds off the vaccine, because the barn's been seeded down with a vaccine strain, when we go back unconventional, we get a real performance kick because our coccidiostats are that much more effective. And it's very important actually if you're using a anticoccidial vaccine that you do not use any um, anticoccidials in the feed. You don't want to put an anticoccidial into a feed that is being fed to a bird that's been vaccinated because you'll literally kill the vaccine. Because what you're trying to do when you have a vaccine for coxy is you're actually trying to produce a, a, a vaccine reaction and you want coxy to develop and you're putting, you're actually um, introducing a strain that's very sensitive. So everyone who's involved in the, in the, in the flock of, in question needs to be aware of what's going on so that the appropriate feed can be given to vaccinated birds or vice versa, that, that the medicated feed can be given to non-vaccinated birds in order to control the coccidiosis. 
And if you were to come along and then feed, uh, say from day one, you put in a really an anti-coccidial in the feed, you would prevent the bird from getting the coxie vaccine. So it needs to be a bit of a team effort. These birds are on a coccidia stat in the feed. Okay, so this would be like our conventional program. This is what we've done for years. This is what most of Ontario has been doing for years. There's basically three types of anticoxidias. One is uh, synthetic chemicals. If you use a chemical, the chemical coccidiocidal products tend to shut down all oocysts production. However, the only drawback is that with repeated use, you do get resistance developing. The second class of anticoxidias, which is the ionophores. And they are produced by fermentation. And the ionophores are really the mainstay of the anticoxidials. Many of the ionophore products we have today registered in Canada have some antibacterial effect. And they also allow some oocyst cycling at the same time that they will actually prevent uh, some of the oocysts from completing the life cycle. They have um, a, a specifically affect ion transport into the cell membranes of the protozoa, a very complex type of, of um, mode of action, and they tend to have been used for a long period of time and are less prone to resistance than some of the chemicals. There's now a third class, and that is what I call potentiated ionophores, and those would be mixtures of an ionophore with uh, nicarbazin. Our goal with anticoxidial medication programs is to provide uh, programs that offer really good protection, performance, they're cost effective, and they also maintain the life of the products themselves. We are concerned about antimicrobial resistance. The genetic basis for resistance within the coccidia is not very complex. And in some cases, it's a single gene change, a single mutation, which is, can cause resistance. The only way to cope with that, actually, is to change to another anticoxidial. To minimize resistance, you want to make sure you don't use them continuously. You want to be strategically placing them in potentially the right, the right season of the year and only using them every so often for potentially one or two flocks at a time. It is very common in Canada to start off on day one with a coccidiostat. Um, most people will actually carry a coccidiostat right through to slaughter so that the oocyst numbers don't build up for the next flock. And um, what we're talking about there is in finisher feeds or perhaps withdrawal feeds. And the only coccidiostats that we're using there are products that have a, a no withdrawal. Um, and then they can be used very safely. Um, there are some chemical products that do require withdrawal. So the reason why there is a withdrawal for some of the anticoxidial medications, it's to do with the clearance of the drug from the tissues of the bird. That is Health Canada's decision as to how many days withdrawal there will be, zero up to four or five potentially in some of these anticoxidial medications. So they're positioned in a rotation program. Broiler rotation programs, we typically will use two medications. We'll use a, a a chemical or they call it a potentiated chemical, meaning a chemical ionophore combination in the starter period um, where we want to have a very strong product that will keep populations of coxy down. A lot of feed companies rotate their coccidiosis program coccidiostats, they rotate quarterly to match the season of the year. And then we'll switch over in the grower finisher and typically right through to, to market with um, an ionophore and we'll rotate these programs. The rotation programs that people follow religiously today have been very beneficial in reducing the incidence of coccidiosis. The local uh, management is the absolute key to success in growing broilers. Uh, and in a situation where a person, for example, checks their broiler flock before they go off to some other job, and they come back and maybe the ventilation has gone out at 10 o'clock in the morning and so on, versus the one where they're in the facility several times a day, they're checking the waters, they're checking the feeders, and they're particularly checking the ventilation and making sure everything is, is good there. They're gonna get the best results. And they're the ones that actually decisions should be made on. Now, if all those things are in place and they're not getting good results, uh, maybe there is a reason to change anticoxidial programs. But 
uh, they shouldn't be, those decisions shouldn't be made based on the problem problems. It's an evolution. I think the key to keeping problems to a minimum are uh, number one, getting good chicks from the hatchery. Regular management. I mean, that's the first thing. And the other thing is uh, using somebody like Alex. There's, uh, there's five or six Ontario veterinarians that specialize in poultry and taking advantage of their knowledge. I mean, that's what they do. They're professionals and um, it's, it's money well spent. Yeah, you have, a, you have a program, they establish it. That's what they're trained to do rather than sorry you go back 30 years ago and everybody had a medicine cabinet full of different medicines and you're medicating the farmer not not the not the bird so i think it's just uh, it's the way things the way things are today things have evolved and things are changing and you need a professional and as i said it's money well spent